Hello everyone and welcome back to another Super Rugby Podcast with your hosts, Damien Warren and... Toby Harris. Toby, 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 Toby. <laughs> you do that all the time now. Don't we've, like it. We've got a special podcast on our hands today, don't we? We do. We have a special guest. We do. But we'll get to that in a minute because before all that, what, are the, what do our listeners have to do? Well, they've got, to, they've got to follow us. They've got a five-star rating. They've got to do whatever they can to make us more popular. And if you could go on, write us a review, apparently... I've been told it makes a huge difference. Does it? So if you've got like five thousand reviews, how many do we have? Do we have like twenty seven? Twenty seven. Yeah, so we're like it's loads. times that by a thousand, <laughs> and we're going to do really well. So get out there if you can. Take five minutes to, uh, well, actually ten because it's going to be such a good review. It's going to take you that much time. Mm. Anyway, without further ado, we've got a special guest today. It is the one, the only Gary Mercer. Gazza Bazza Wazza. Now. For those that don't know uh, Gary, if you were born in the last decade, then you probably don't know who Gary Mercer is, but (laughs) he is a rugby league legend and rugby union legend. Uh, He's played for many a team, international uh, rugby league player, but has also coached the Glasgow Warriors, uh, the Scotland Academy, Yorkshire Carnegie, and many others, and is currently working at the wonderful school of Asheville College. So welcome to the show, Gary. Thank you, David. Good to see you. Um, and thank you, Toby. <laughs> Great to be here. So you're originally from New Zealand, Gary, as, as people might have guessed. It's all Kiwis on the show. Yeah, which is good. I think it's great, yeah. We're not tainted by that English stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you obviously grew up on the North Island, which was, I would say, the hotbed of rugby league. It certainly was. Uh, back, I was, I was born, well, so I was born in Tarana, New Zealand which is in the Bay of Plenty. And Toby will know he's born on the East Coast, which is Poverty Bay. So when Captain Cook landed many years ago, he landed in the Bay of Plenty. He ran into fruit farms. He ran into pigs, deer. Then he thought, I'd go around the corner to the East Coast, to Zakaha, a little place called Togu- Togumaru Bay, Toluga Bay. And there was Toby's ancestors, all there. But they had no food. So they called it Poverty Bay. Uh, it was a hot beat of rugby league. Yes. And... What was it like living in the North Island? Because uh, let's be honest to say, rugby league is a huge sport in New Zealand, but naturally a lot of kids, a lot of boys and a lot of girls go and play rugby. So what was it like living in the North Island and why did you choose rugby league over rugby? Oh, that's a good question, Damon. Uh, what, it, what it was when I was at school, it was a stigma to play for your first 15. That was the big thing. And I was very fortunate to play. I played, I think I, when I got to my older years, if I say I was in year 11, at back home in New Zealand, I was in the second 15. And then I knew I only had two more years. So the following year, when I got into year 12, as you would say, um, I got first 15 captain. Yeah. And i tell you what, that was pretty good. At the time, Rotorua Boys High was really big then, Western Heights. Now, if anyone knows Hickory, the All Black Hooker, he was from Western Heights. Um, Wayne Shelford, uh, not Wayne Shelford, but uh, his brother uh, went to Western Heights. And there's, uh, there's a real... You know, real um, competitiveness in those schools there, and it's really good rugby. So I was playing rugby on a Saturday as first 15 captain. It was great. And then on a Sunday, a good friend of mine um, said to me, so why don't you have come down and have a game of rugby league? And, and he, I said, okay, I'll pop down there. And this is about under 15 level. So I went down there, and I said, actually, I quite like this game because you don't have to pass the ball, really. You just run. <laughs> You can get greedy. So you, you it doesn't were, matter. You, you, were, you were fifteen. Could I just? This yes. is quite. You yeah, were fifteen, is. and you were first fifteen captain. Because that's pretty impressive yeah, on it yeah. in itself. For those that don't know, when you're fifteen, you're probably year eleven. Yeah. yeah. So uh, first I might have lied a little bit. I might have been 16. I might just been so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it, it sounds good, though. It does. That no. sounds great, mate. <laughs> yeah, no, I was, de- I was definitely around about 15 or 16. But I remember playing for, for, for Pikiao, Pikiao Rugby League Club in Rotorua. Um, it was just based out of Rotorua, a place called Maria, which is out by the Rotorua Lakes. So you've got Rotokahi, Rotokawa, Lake Rotokawa, Lake Rotokiti. So I was out there, and it was um, it was a great setup. Majority of the boys there, 
that were there were all mob members. So if you talk about mob members in New Zealand, you've got a mob called the Mungrel Mob, yeah. the Black Power. Yeah, I was in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those two, you don't want to be I was, involved uh, with that. I was, I was in both of those two <laughs> at the same time. You were a white boy from the <laughs> South Island. You don't even know what they are. So, <laughs> so we're, the, we're the leather jackets, don't know. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> well, mine had black and mongrel mob. <laughs> no, uh, d- no, maybe I started my that. own. Maybe you I started can't. my own gang. All of our uh, New Zealand listeners are going, Oh my god, <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> so embarrassed. Yeah, so, so a lot of the boys there were like, um, related to the mongrel mob, and it was quite, it was quite weird because there's no white men playing for the team except for me at under 15 level. And then I sort of went to progress through the ranks. Once I got to under 18s, and then I started playing premiership rugby, rugby league then. So I really enjoyed the rugby on the Saturday with the school, first 15 captain, then going, and then doubling up on the Sunday with the rugby league. Was it, was it hard for you to go from rugby league to rugby and switch back like rules wise and, you know, different no, things like that? Or was it quite uh, simple? It's quite simple to me because I was obviously when I was playing um, rugby, I was playing 10, which is first five, eight, yeah. as we mm. call it back in New Zealand. Um, so, no, there was, there's there's no uh, difficulty in that respect. I think um, <laughs> schoolboy rugby is obviously a lot different than any any club rugby uh, and, and and sort of provincial rugby. So it was quite easy for the transition to go yeah. back and forth. So, and I, I just enjoyed it. So I embraced every weekend because um, I knew I was playing rugby on a Saturday and league on a Sunday. I was going to say, as a kid, you'd be absolutely frothing for that, wouldn't you? You know, oh. playing two sports on one weekend. Certainly, and, and, and now you know we sort of say to children now you can't play, you can't double up. You got to play for your club or your school. I think what's what's priority is my view is that when you're in school, you play for your school. Yeah, first and foremost, and the club comes second. And that was quite good for me back then because obviously school with rugby was on the Saturday, and then the rugby league was on the Sunday. Do you think that's pretty normal for for kids to start off playing rugby and then make the switch, or do you, do you think it's it's abnormal? I mean, what I'm trying to say is, do kids generally go rugby league first and foremost or or in New Zealand did they do, do both because I think over here it'd be fair to say in England I'm talking about uh, or Australia mm. it's more the other way isn't it you know they might start off playing rugby league and then merge into rugby yeah uh, is th- that's probably more financial than anything else but but yeah do you think uh, it's normal for a New Zealander uh, to play rugby and then go into league I think so. I've, I think that you know, the, as you know, we're all Kiwis here, and we can adapt pretty easy. Um, you know, and if it's a transition between one one game to another, and that's pretty similar with the same shape ball, I think it's quite easy in that respect. Because I think as a kid growing up in New Zealand, and Toby, you'll know, and obviously yourself as well, Damo, is that you know, all you wanted to be was outside. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and yeah. I say to the children down at Greenhome, I say, look, you need to get off your devices. Let's get outside. Let's do some exercise. Apart from Shortland Street. <laughs> Everyone want to watch Short and Street, <laughs> and, and, that, and I think that's that's my biggest bugbear to this day, is is with children in schools, and obviously I'm working in schools, and I see this that these kids don't want to get outside. No, they don't, do they? They're stuck to a screen now. They're stuck to a screen, and that's really sad. And you know that again, you know, is down to you know how they're being brought up and what's what's the focus in the house. I, I do I think, think though, you know, we are uniquely unique, <laughs> if you can say that. Can we say that? Um, because in New Zealand, there is so much to offer outside. You know, we, yes. we've, we've spoken before this. This is part yes. of the reason why we're doing this was, you know, the type of things that you get up to in New yeah. Zealand, you know, a lot of farms around. Hmm. Uh, there's there's a lot of sports that you can yeah. play. There's the mountains. There's the lakes. There's the, 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 beaches. the, the beaches. But yeah. also, I think during winter, <clears throat> the winters aren't as harsh. Yeah. You know, and, and definitely like rugby wise, playing rugby in this country in the winter is a bit, you know, you don't want to be a back. Yeah, it's very bleak. It's it's hard work. But then in New Zealand, it's not as cold. No, you so you can still fling it and ying it. You, you start in the sun and you finish in the sun. And exactly. there's, that, there's that little window in the middle yeah. that we call winter. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think when I look back at my childhood, and you probably guys would be the same, I was brought up on a dairy farm. So before I go to school, I had to go collect 300 cows at the back of this massive farm just with one dog, and I'd have to bring those those cows into the cow shed and I'd have to milk them with my grandfather and my uncle and that was about two and a half hours milking and then I had I'd come home my grandma had my porridge on the table at eight o'clock and it was on the table at eight o'clock and if I was late it was cold yeah so I'd eat it yeah and then from there I'd jump on a push bike I'd ride probably about a mile and a half to the bus stop hop put my bike up and throw it against the fence there just jump on the bus and go to school and then the reverse coming back because obviously in, in New Zealand with, with the dairy farm you, you're milking morning and night 
So that's what I was doing. And I think that I embraced that culture because of the work ethic as well. And I think that's what I've got the, to this day, work got, ethic. You probably just got stuck into it. I loved it. Yeah. Just loved it. So, yeah, growing up on a dairy farm, mm-hmm. you know, the grandmother's got the porridge ready for you. That sounds all really good. It was very yeah, you strict. Were, you were pampered. No, I wasn't pampered. I'm telling you now. <laughs> I'm telling you now. Did you was, have your clothes sort of laid uh, out in your bed as well, Gary? Certainly up. not. Certainly not. My grandfather was very, very strict. And the amount of times he s- swore at me on the farm, he, he, he hit me with a bit, bit of polythene if I didn't get anything right. It's for it was, the cows, isn't it? <laughs> it is for the cows, but I got it a couple of times um, because I probably missed a cow. You know, we've got 345 cows and I come back with 344. Did you I have to count trouble. them all in? Yes, yeah, pretty much. But they knew straight away when you, when you filled up the, 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 the cow race at the cow shed that, that you know, if you we were, were cow sure. short, we were short. But it was, listen, it was a great experience. And, and that's what I'm saying with me going forward with my work ethic. And then obviously, because when you look at it, I wasn't one of the best players that played for New Zealand. But what I had was work ethic. And I think that's got, that took me a long way. Mm. Um, there's a lot of more skillful players out there. And you look at them and go, man, you're going to be an All Black. You're going to play for New Zealand. You're going to play rugby league for New Zealand. And those guys didn't make it. Yeah. You know, and you sort of think, how did you not make it? And then I look back at what I did, and I, had, I think it was my upbringing, my, the work ethic I had, I knew I had to work twice as hard mm. to, to, to make the team. An example would be when I played signed professional in 87 with Bradford Northern, I'd go to, go to Bradford to have my short stints over there, and then um, I'd have come back, and I, I sort of think, I'm going to be guaranteed a, an all black, a Kiwi shirt. I wasn't. Any of the boys that went to, Brad, went to, sorry, to Britain had to come back and trial for the Kiwis. Yeah. You had to prove yourself. You, you talk about family, and one thing I've learned, you know, when I'm talking to kids, and you know, they ask me, "What do I need to do to become a professional rugby player?" Yeah. The key thing for me is having someone with your back, someone that's mm. going to guide you, someone that's going to, uh, you know, tell you what to eat, what to do, and keep mm. you honest. And you know, family's very important with that, isn't it? If you've got if you've got someone who's got some knowledge, who's prepared to drive you the length and the breadth of the country, that's so important, yeah. isn't it? it? It is, but I never had a father figure as a child growing up. Um, sadly, I lost my father when I was young, and um, he left a family of five behind with my mum. So my mum was my role model. Mm. You know, She knew nothing about rugby, but she knew, Gary, if you work hard, there's a fair chance you're going to go places. So you know, we were brought up in a household with just the mum, and then my stepfather... Stepfather, a couple of years later, um, you know, and he was a phenomenal um, influence on me as well because he loved rugby, he played rugby. So, you know, I had that backbone there, but also my grandfather was the biggest one for me. Yeah. Um, and I can tell you a true story way back in, it would have been 1988, uh, test, test match in Carlaw Park. And um, he was so proud of me because I played for New Zealand. It was so funny because he's, he's a big six foot six Irishman tough as old boots you know and quite arrogant you yeah. know and, and can boss himself or uh, so boss we, himself about we know where you get yeah, from say, oh, I know where you get it from <laughs> well no I actually learned it from him I said I'm not going to be like you grandfather but anyway just just going back to that we won the test match I think we are playing France whatever and I walked into the change sheds and, I'm, and who was standing in the middle of the change shed was my grandfather I'm going grandfather how did you get in here don't you worry, boy. I told him I was Gary Mercer's grandfather. You know, real deep voice. And I said, yes, but, you know, it was embarrassing. <laughs> you know, it was quite embarrassing in a way. But when I look back at it now, I just realize how proud he was. Yeah, definitely. And he got past all security. And then Graham Lowe comes in, the Kiwi coach, and he shakes hands with him. And it's like, whoa, this is Graham Lowe meeting my grandfather. How good's that? Yeah. So, you know, that was How old were you then? I was probably 22, 21, mm. 22 at the time. That would time. have been a, such a surreal moment as well. <laughs> it, you know, a youngster. Yeah, it, it, it was. I mean, but that wasn't my debut. My debut was uh, back in 86 for New Zealand. Right. When I toured, I got on tour. I don't know if you remember the winger called Mark Bourneville. Played no. on the wing, massive. He got injured, and then I got called into the touring side. So when you had the, the Kiwi pitcher, you had all the team there, and then you had a little... Who are you? We've all been there. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on the top right yeah. before. <laughs> that, what was quite, I, I was really taken back because my big idol then was Mark Graham. I don't know if anyone knew Mark Graham. Mark Graham was a Kiwi captain at the time. Hugh McGann was there. You had the legends like Olsen Fuller Piner, Fred Akoi, Dana Hara, you know, Gary Campbell. I mean, they were legends. And yeah, I was yeah. a kid at home and used to watch these guys in the early 80s playing for New Zealand I go now I'm actually on tour with them yeah 
it was just you know it's just one of those experiences in life that and that's why I say to the boys last year the first 15 boys last year at Asheville here I said boys listen life's about memories let's make a good memory today yeah, you know and, and that's what it's about so you made the move to the UK what the big question is how was that you've obviously come from you know living up north mm. the sun on your back mm. you know mm. uh, the work ethic of the farm you're moving up north so I've got a couple of questions for you was the deal done before you came over or did you get a deal when you came over? And back in those days, there wasn't many coming over. You know, it was a long time ago. Did you take a boat or did you take the play, mate? <laughs> Canoe, mate. <laughs> <laughs> brought some of my Maori mates from the local club to row me over. No, uh, it was quite funny. It can't, I was playing for the provincial side by plenty at the time. Um, and then uh, what actually happened? Yes, okay, and I made the Kiwis. And then, the, funny enough, the test match, and this is again a memory, a test match was uh, against Australia at Lang Park. And that's when they had all the legends playing for Australia. And at the time, we got so much stick. Oh, this New Zealand team's not going to do anything. They're rubbish. They're all young kids. They're not going to, there's only Hugh McGann in there, and, you know, really, and that was it. And we went out there against Australia. And I remember sitting in the change sheds before the game, and Sammy Stewart uh, at the time was, he'd only make the keys, he'd only been, what, five tests to his name then he was still young and he's sitting in the change shed with me and we looked at each other and he says I don't want to go out there well, what's the matter I'm, I'm scared we're coming up against the world champions so we go out there and we beat them 13-6 beat Australia at Lang Park 13-6 and I scored the winning try happy days you know from leg end to legend yeah in one night and you know and that's where Bradford picked me up and so going back to your question um, uh, I had a signed contract yeah at the yeah. time, and, and and I can say this, I think, I was the highest paid player at Bradford. <laughs> now, you know, back then, well, it wasn't a lot of money, but it was, you know, it was something, it was really good. It was great. I remember going to the to the office every every week and picking up a brown envelope. I was like, oh man, the hell good's this? So I'm it was playing. cash? They used to give you cash? They give me cash. No, they, they, they give me a big check for my, for my contract, but I was getting a weekly wage as well. So back then, I, I, I tell you what, I was getting 150 pounds a week. That's, that's good. I. That's more than I get here. <laughs> <laughs> that was, a, and then I remember just going to get this brown envelope. Like, oh man, how good! This? I'm, I'm playing rugby league on the other side of the world. I'm getting paid for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. A and you obviously loved it. So therefore, oh. you, you've pretty much stayed in the UK pretty much ever since. Pre yeah. Well, I've been here 87 years and haven't really gone home and settled. I've yeah. gone home for holidays, but that's about it. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much a British citizen, yeah. Yeah. So you obviously have played at the highest level. You've coached you know, at a very high level, obviously not internationally, yes. but you've coached at a very, very high level. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say the key ingredients are to success in pro sport? You've got to work hard. It's just work ethic. It's just... Um, and also, you know, we talk about resilience in children and resilience in sport. You know, when, and there's a quote I was reading, funny enough, I was listening to Clive Woodward just the other day, and, he, and he's a really interesting guy, is Clive Woodward, and how he did really well with regard to the World Cup in 2003. But it's just, it's just, just working hard, you know, and doing the extras. And that's, that's the big one for me. If, if, if somebody would ask me that now, a young lad coming through, and he's, we've got a couple of good, talented rugby players here in the school. If they were to say, I says, son, just hard work. You work hard, you're always going to get a result. It's the reps, isn't it? It is. You know, if you're so a hooker, it's yeah. getting out there and it's throwing, throwing that ball. thousands yeah. of If you're a kicker, it's kicking thousands yeah. of goals, isn't oh, it? Yuck. It's working on that sidestep. It's yeah. doing the extras out of training that oh, yeah. that makes the difference. And, so, and I think we go back to family, you know, or yep. someone batting for you. You know, you always yeah. need someone behind so, that's, yeah. that's keeping you honest, whether that's at home whether that's the girlfriend, the brother, yeah. Yeah. doesn't matter who or it boyfriend. is. The boyfriend. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so you did. were you a player coach? Were you a player coach for yes. the Halifax? Halifax, or? Bl Halifax Blue Sox back in, geez, I, th I signed for them in 98 from Leeds. I left Leeds in 90. I had another year to go in Leeds, Rhinos, and I went to Gary Heatherington at Leeds Rhinos. Says, I've had enough because I'm not challenging myself yeah. here. I was at the time, I was probably 35 at the time, so I was getting back into my career. So I had a good friend, David Hobbs, who I played with at Bradford Northern. He says, Gary, look, I'm the manager at Halifax Blue Sox. We want you to come to Blue Sox. At the time, they're called Halifax Blue Sox. So I said, okay, I'll, let's have a look at the deal. The deal wasn't overly great, but there was a challenge there for me. And I'll be brutally honest, 
it wasn't about the money for me. It was about playing the game. I love the game. Yeah. I love the the stigma about being professional. I love the stigma, you know, being out on the park and these people cheering your name. You know, it's just one of those things that you actually dream of. And I remember as a kid, I wanted to be an All Black. And my stepfather turned to me one day and he says, Gary, listen, unless you start kicking those goals, okay, they will, they will pick a winger ahead of you that's a goal kicker. You cannot just be an out-and-out -out winger. Um, so he said to me, and also, you will not be an all-black first 5'8 either. I said, why? He says, you can't kick off both feet. I went, you're kidding me. He said, no, you won't. You, you can't pass caught. off both hands either. I can't either. pass <laughs> off both hands either. So, but, like, you yeah. know, going, going back to the question. Yes. So sorry. coaching... Coaching rugby league yes. to a very high level yes. and now coaching rugby union, mm -hmm. was it an easy transition or was, uh, it, was it quite difficult? It was, it, was, it was difficult for me because I wish I actually left a lot earlier rugby right. league, left rugby league and got Why? into rugby union. Because I look at coaches now that are – because when you see a rugby league player going to rugby union, they're going in not as a, a head coach, they're going as a, as an assistant coach, a defensive yeah. coach. So the avenue for rugby league players was go as defensive coaches. So we Sean Edwards, you know, um, Andy Farrell yeah. was another one. Um, and there's another guy called Brad Davis. And this <laughs> cracks me up, not, nothing against Brad because he's a good friend of mine, is that he couldn't tackle. <laughs> but he was at WAS as a defense coach. Yeah, You know, something. if he can do it, surely I can get in there because yeah. I, I know I can tackle a little bit. So it was just getting that opportunity to get into and. The transition was quite easy. And then once you got in as a defensive coach, you surrounded yourself by the rugby union coaches. Yeah. Uh, Sean Lanine was the one that was at Glasgow Warriors in New Zealand from um, Auckland, New Zealand. So me and Sean linked up with Shade Munro, who's a Scot Scotsman at the Warriors. And I learned so much off those Just two. Just like a sponge. I was a sponge off yeah. them. More so Shade Munro, who played for Scotland. Um, I think he played in the era of Doddy Ware and all that, the yeah. Shade. But I think he only played about five five cats for his country. But r really knowledgeable. Yeah. So I learned a lot of him. So that was that was the, the positive for me. And, and how did you get into the rugby coaching? You know, especially from a, rugby league coaching for, you know, a good team, high standard, and then you've gone... Yeah. And started coaching rugby. Well, I was quite fortunate. I met, met somebody and I spoke to, uh, you might know the name, Dick Best, a yes. form, former England, former England um, coach, head coach. And um, he was he had his agency inside running. So I got involved with them and he, he sort of touted me about. And then he said, look, there's an opportunity up in Scotland. They're looking right. for a, a defensive coach of the Warriors at the time. And I thought, oh, well, I'll have a look at it. So what I was doing, I was coaching Oldham Rugby League in the second division. And I was coaching them, say, Monday night, because they were like a part-time team. And then on the Tuesday, I hop in the car, drive to Scotland, wow. stay over in a hotel, coach Glasgow Warriors on the Tuesday afternoon, and then the Wednesday morning, then drive back down to Oldham, and then carry on, and then back at training on Thursday. Where's Oldham? Oldham's in Saddleworth, just up, just as you go over the tops. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. just Saddleworth up the top there, just the side of Manchester. So I was doing that, so I was doing a lot of commuting, and then I did that for about a year, and then they turned to me and said, "We want you full time." So, that's happy days. My, my my view is about opportunities. You know, if if you're given an opportunity, take it. Because if you don't, you, you know, like sit there ten years later and go, "Actually, I regret that." Don't worry, I've had a lot of regrets. I've done a lot of things wrong. <laughs> I'm honest, I'm not perfect. Okay, and I'm sure we all have. Yeah. And but no, I haven't done anything. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. <laughs> but you know. But just My DVS form says I've done nothing wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, it's quite funny. So just go back to your question. Yeah, um, was it about the transition? Transition, yeah. 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 As, it, like I said, I developed. It took me years. And yeah. I, did, we, I was very fortunate. I'd sit there with Shade Monroe seven years in with the Glasgow Warriors. We'd look at each other and go, we'd pinch each other and we'd look at each other and we'd go, um, we're still here. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> the shelf life of a pro coach, you're probably only looking at three years. Well, that's what I was going to say. Um, What's the world of professional coaching like? Because, you know, we think about rugby as this, you know, honourable game mm. where we expect the players to be, stick with the same team. You know, we don't like players to move all over the place. But it does seem from the outside looking in now mm. that rugby is moving more towards the football style where you don't get results. You know, yep. the blame is always put on to the coach rather than the players. And as you say, the shelf life is, is very small. So yeah. that ultimately must have an effect on you thinking, mm. you know, do I buy a house? Do I rent a house? Because, you know, I know a lot of football coaches, they don't buy houses yeah, no. in, in the areas in that they coach because they just, it's not worth 
putting the roots down for the family. Well, the money they're on, they could probably grow four or five in the same place. Yeah. But, you know, just, just going back to your question, um, what was your question again? I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> What's it really like coaching oh, yeah, professional? Yeah, yeah, professionally? I, I thought it was that. Um, <laughs> professional, uh, I think at the time with the Glasgow Warriors, it was a good time to go. And, and I like anything in, in life, it's all about timing. And how you time it, and this this is what I'm going to get to here, is that we went to the Warriors. No one expected the Glasgow Warriors to do any good, you know. They thought oh, Glasgow Warriors, who are they? And that's what it was like, you know. So we're in this Pro 12, Rabo direct at the time, and we were the obviously with the Irish teams and the Welsh teams, and um, we actually got better and better as the years go on. So I, I, I think I started in 2005. By 2010, we were uh, we were recognised as the best defensive team, and this is because I was defensive coach. I have to say this: we were the best defensive team in the Rabo Direct, and it wasn't. Yeah. I've got the facts here. If you want me, I can show you some paper that work. You know, some no, we, we believe you, okay. Gary. You've so told us you didn't about bring your paperwork with you. You've uh, told us about a hundred times already before <laughs> this. <laughs> so you know that was my claim to fame, really. You know, we improved. So, but I think if I was to, for anyone to walk into say, I'll give you an example of Bath Rugby at the moment. They're all over the place. It's like the Titanic, you know, with these rats running everywhere. But it's really cutthroat. Yes. Again, results are so important. But I think the big thing is building that culture. And second, the second big thing is the real big thing is when you're head coach, you got to make sure who's below you, behind you, mm. your assistant coaches, your PE staff, your, sorry, your PE staff, your, uh, your physios, everyone is on the same wavelength as you. Because if they're not, it can be very, very disruptive. Absolutely. So looking at all the players you've coached, which is a heck of a lot, you've obviously coached um, the rugby league, um, you've played mm-hmm. at highest level, you've coached rugby. Who's the best player that you've played with and who's the best player that you've ever coached? And we don't want this mellow yellow response, Gary. We, we want you to, to, to put stick, your, stick the mask and in the ground and name. put someone... Well, you, you all know that I'm a big fan of the Black Pearl, which is Ellery Hanley. By far, the best player. Yeah. By far. I remember I was at Warrington at the time. He actually was signing players, but he was a player at Leeds Rhinos yeah. at the time, and Dougie Lawton was the head coach. I don't know if anyone knew Dougie Lawton. He did really well with Jonathan Davis and Alan Tate uh, at Witness over all those years, very successful. So then Leeds took on Dougie Lawton, but Dougie Lawton made Ellery Hanley pick his forwards that he wanted to play with. So this is what I think, is, this is where I was saying, oh man, I'm privileged here. I didn't get a phone call from um, Dougie Lawton, I got a phone call from Ellery Hanley. As a young, strapping guy who's only just been in the second row for two, two second season, just going into my second season, come from the centres, because I got too slow. And then they put me in the second row at Warrington because of my work rate. And um, he rang me up, and he goes, hello. Real deep voice, you know. And I go, hello, who's this? It's Ellery. I says, Ellery? Ellery who? It's Ellery Hanley. Oh, is, is he, is, did you have a cell phone? Back then we had a cell phone. I think it was a cell phone. I can't remember. I reckon, but it, a I reckon, I reckon <laughs> you had a pager, mate. I, 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 reckon, I could see Gary with one of those pages. Yeah. Do you so, know what I mean? Oh, sorry, I've got to take this call. You've got to listen to the story, boys. <laughs> okay, so it was a great st- great thing, you know, that this this legend, rugby league legend, had rung me up and he said, look, I'm looking for, I'm putting a pack together at Leeds Rhinos and I want you part of it. I said, well, at the time I was talking to Castleford at the time. And uh, I just and then it just went from there. And then I remember when I first signed, and I and I, Ellery rang me up as soon as I arrived in Leeds. I went to New Zealand home for a holiday. Come back, Ellery rang me up. He says, "I'll meet you down around our park." I went, "Oh, okay." So I went down around our park. I thought all the boys would be there. It was just him. He hops out. He says, "Come on," and he goes for a run. Now Ellery and he says, and he just took off. And I was like, "Oh shit!" Excuse my language. I've got to be, get, keep with this guy. So I kept with him. I think we did probably five mile or whatever, really quick pace. And he looked at me and he says, um, you'll do for me. Hopped in his car and took off. And I went, man, that was a legend just said that to me. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so how long were these contracts for? Because you sort of say you rung you up and then you went. I did a, I think I signed a two year with Leeds. But, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, Toby. I backed myself. Yeah. Because I believed if I go there and I do well, and they'll they'll want you back. They'll want me back. Yeah. But secondly, also I put myself in the shop window for anywhere else. So, you know, my longest contract was probably two years. I didn't sign any more than that because I knew I had some flexibility uh, money-wise yeah. in the second year to say, look, can I negotiate a better deal? So, you know, it was a negotiation thing that I, th- I felt was important. Because you, you played 158 
games. This is what Wikipedia says for, for Leeds Rhinos. Would, yes. you, would you say, I mean, you've obviously played 82 games for Warrington, 40 for, so you, you know, it's not like you've, You've dipped in and dipped out. You've, you've everywhere you've gone. You've you've played for a good length of time. But do you think that Leeds Rhinos was your favourite club? Certainly, certainly was. I mean, when you look at Leeds Rhinos, the setup there, the stadium, the crowds who were averaging, oh, I think fourteen, fifteen thousand at the time, it was phenomenal. And then the players, the calibre of player you're playing with. Don't get me wrong, my Halifax days were even better. I mean, you, you know, Toby, you brought up the question about as a player coach. So my Leeds Rhino days were the best days. I think the educational days of rugby and coaching was my Halifax days. Yeah. Because I was player coach. Yeah. So therefore... And how did that come up though? Uh, John Pendlebury, former Great Britain loose forward, lovely guy, um, and he was coach at Halifax at the time. Uh, he had a bit of bit of turmoil within the club. He just jumped ship and left. The club turned around and said, we've got no other place. And they looked at me because of my years and my experience with the Rhinos. They thought, well, Gary, would you want to be a player coach? It's bit, you know, it's obviously cost, cost effective, you know, as well, cost yeah, effective isn't it? Yeah. Having, a, having a good player yeah. and, and, and them coaching as yeah. well and having the coach on the, on the pitch. Yeah. yeah. You know? Are you actually even allowed to, you know, could, could England have player coach? Could you do that? Right, they well, you could, but they, they're not good enough coaches, are they? You're not going to get <laughs> Owen Farrell to coach England. But what I mean is like you're not allowed to coach on the, yeah. on the pitch side. It was, just, so. it was a quite a unique one because I knew I had to perform. So I had to perform at training. I had to give speeches, obviously half-time speeches. And, you know, even if your game wasn't going so well, and I'm not sort of patting myself on the back here, but, you know, consistently, I was a consistent performer. Not Again, like I say, never your best player, but always in and carrying the ball forward, getting over the game line. The Richie McCaw style. So, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I, I couldn't put, a, put myself in that bracket, but, you know, quali- he's quality. Yeah. But, you know, so I knew I always had a, something to fall back on. So if I'm at half time and, you know, we're not doing so well, and this would have happened many a times in Halifax, is uh, that, you know, I inspired those boys for that second half to do better. But I also inspired myself at the same time. Yeah. But I, I remember I made sure I got the right assistant coach because I said to him, don't ever take me off. And don't send a water carrier on to say, Gary, you're off, we're giving you five minutes because I didn't like it. It was, yeah, it was, yeah, a, bit yeah. of, it was yeah. a bit of a joke in the end, you know, that he'd send water carriers on to me. So Gary, you're off now. And then I'd turn around and get to him to you know what I mean? No, no, I'm not coming off. So, so you, you've obviously mentioned Ellie Hanley as your best yes, player you've yes. played with. What about the best player you've coached? <sighs> I know you haven't coached Toby, so you can't say I mention coached, Toby. But I haven't uh, coached Toby yet, but I'd love to coach him. I'll sort him out. Um, the, I think I'd have to go back. If I'm talking about professional rugby, if we're talking professional rugby, I was very privileged to be involved with the, the John Barkley, the Kelly Browns. Um, Johnny Beatty's up in, in Glasgow, and th- and they were they were the ones that sort of sort of bought into what I was about because when I went up there, because I come from rugby league, they've never had a rugby league defensive coach in there, and I was just getting them smashing each other in grids, and they didn't like they they're like what's going on here, you know you can't do this. One of the assistant coaches says, oh you're going to be careful. I says why? Oh they might get injured. I says well they they come focused and they do the session or else. The, the no good be near so i tell you a true story um geez, i'm just trying to remember his name but he's a british lion um he's a hooker i forget his name now it'll come to me in a minute but he, he was at the, he was at the glasgow Warriors at the time and he just finished the tour and he just come back into pre-season training and he wouldn't he couldn't do this technical uh technical drill with with the, the shoulder and feet, feet placement and stuff like that so i grabbed him by the shirt and i said mate come here out of here boom and i'll show you and i showed him boom and then he went in and I thought, okay, that's fine. He, he did it right this time. I said, well done, mate. Well done. Excellent. And then I'm having lunch with the boys upstairs after, and one of the players comes up to me and goes, uh, uh, Gary, you know, you know that guy you grabbed and threw out of the drill? I said, yeah, he's a British lion. I went, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so I went back and apologized, and he said, no, no, you're right. The guy was really, really, you know, really good about it. But, I, you know, so when I, it's like anything. Like Sean Edwards made an instant impact when he went to Wales. Because it was just another breed of person, yeah. another breed of coach. And same with Farrell. I was going to say, is that why you think Farrell's doing? He's doing a pretty good job with Ireland. A- Andy Farrell, quality player, tough as it nails, and that's what you see in Owen. Yeah, you see Owen playing now. You can see his dad. Yeah, you know, because I played against Andy so many times when he was at Wigan. So when I was at Leeds, Wigan were like the best, and the Leeds were second. We've never beaten Wigan. We beat them on odd occasion, but they had Vega Tugamala, and they had Fran Botica. 
you know. They had Martin of Fire. They had Martin of Fire. He was a he was a heck of a player, wasn't he? I tried to catch him in a test match, <laughs> and he turned me inside three times, inside and out. It's actually, I, it usually comes up on Facebook every now and then, and I go, oh no, here we go again. And it shows him making a line. I'll tell you the true story again about that one was, I was on the wing, Daryl Williams was a fullback, he got injured. And they said, Gary, you've got to go back to fullback the last 20 minutes. Oh, yeah. And the first thing I said in my head, honestly, it's honest truth. I hope a fire doesn't make a line break. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, within within five or six minutes, he made a line break. And I'm like, here we go. <laughs> and out, and out. he turned me inside out three or four times before he scored on the post. Because I, I would, I would, I thought you might have mentioned Marno Fire as, as the best player. He was, by yeah. far. Sorry, no, I'll take that back. He was a quality player. Yeah. He wasn't well liked when he first came on the scene because what he would do, he'd score a try, run down the side, especially at witness, and he'd run up and he's like this, dancing like this in the crowd. Now, we had a real quality player at Warrington at the time, Des Drummond. I don't know if you heard of him. No. Outstanding player. Uh, probably one of the, you know, with Henderson Gill, some, you know, if people who know rugby league, they know who I'm talking about. But I remember a fire scoring a try. We played. Wigan come to us he scored a try under the sticks and he was dancing like this and Desi Drummond come around the corner and give him one smacked him in the in the in the, in the, in the, in the stomach and he collapsed on the floor and I actually remember that but he did it so discreetly but Desi was black belt in judo yeah so it was that quick you know bang you got him so a fire yeah quality scored some great tries but there's some also some quality players out there at the time there with Henderson Gill Des Drummond just to, just to name a couple yeah Right, um, we're going to get to some uh, quick-fire questions, Gary. Oh, no. So right. you give a brief answer to these. Okay. Okay, brief answer to these. So first one is, we'll hit you off. Rugby union or rugby league? Union. Do you want to go next one, Tobes? UK or New Zealand? UK. Pro coaching or school coaching? School coaching. Playing back when you did or now? Back when I did. Why? Because it was easier then. <laughs> <laughs> I look at those guys now, especially when you see them in the NRL and some, you know, even in the Super League, it's tough because it's all defence orientated. I think, and it's just it's just man on man. As rugby union's a bit more technical, you can have you know, so many variations in rugby union compared to rugby league. Action movie, thriller, or comedy? Uh, thriller, action movie, thriller. Oh, you can't go action movie. <laughs> Action movie thriller. No, action movie. Oh, sorry. Thriller. No, no. I, thr- I think it'd be or a thriller. Comedy. I think it'd be a thriller. I quite like thrillers. Who, who, what's your favourite movie? Oh, jeez. What's his name? Silence of the Lambs, something like that. Oh, that's a cracker. That's something it? different. We want to educate these young lads. Eh? We obviously run a boarding house here and we're at the moment educating them on, on the movies. And some, <laughs> some of the movies know, they though. haven't seen. Like, they haven't seen Gladiator. Oh, oh, love that movie. They haven't seen Braveheart. Yeah. Troy? They probably haven't seen Troy. Troy's not that good, mate. You can't say Gladiator. How good does Brad Brave, Pitt look Brave. at it, though? <laughs> Brad Pitt is sensate. <laughs> Chiseled body. You're going, young for his and head. Beautiful. You're going for his hairdo at the moment, aren't you? Trying to get his body too, bud. Okay. <laughs> uh, reading or listening? Uh, I can't read, so listen. I can't read either. <laughs> I, I, I do. I, people get people get buy me books for Christmas. I don't. I look at them. Look at the pictures, and that's it. I can't read. I'm lazy in that respect. Wheelchair or stainless steel lift? <laughs> Is that when I retire? <laughs> no, that's for next birthday present. Mate. <laughs> <laughs> steel lift, mate. Please. I uh, love that. Uh, curry or chili? Uh, don't like either. Oh, I'm a village. Pa- Get out of there. <laughs> village. <laughs> no What's your favourite meal? I love a pasta meal. Okay. Anything with pasta. Spaghetti bolognese? A bit more advanced than that. Some more. Yeah, some more. Lasagna? Like that. Las- no, Ooh, no, lasagna. That's oh, boring. lasagna. But more advanced. What's more advanced <laughs> than spaghetti <laughs> well, <laughs> Hang on, hang on. Put We're in the pasta. In We're in the pasta world. What's more advanced than the calzone? <laughs> <laughs> Can't be a good pasta. Sweet or meat? Uh, I love sweets. Oh, I would have thought you'd said mm-hmm. meat. Um, Robbie Paul or Henry Paul? I didn't like either of them. Um, <laughs> no, I did. Uh, I don't even know who they are. Rob, you don't, don't know, know who, they they are. who yeah. Robbie or Henry Paul are? Yeah. Who are they? Internet sensations? They, they are rugby league legends. Oh, yeah. are they? Yeah. They're from oh, New Zealand as well. Oh, yeah, oh, they're right, from okay, New Zealand. Cool. The Kiwis, mate. They're good boys. You mentioned that you preferred the UK 
yes. to New Zealand. Why? Because I've been here all my life. Think about it. I mean, I, I, I ring home all the time and I speak to my brothers and sisters and I say, how's it going? The, the economy is this. It's very expensive in New Zealand. Yeah. Um, as you will know, guys. Um, so and when I go to New Zealand and not be disrespectful to my family who live down on the East Coast, uh, sorry, West Coast of the South, they live in Hokitika, which is not far from you, Damo. Hokie? Hokie Village Stokie. down there, eh? And Awful. if you blink, you've already gone past it. It's one of those places. Yeah. And it's tumbleweed country. And um, do you know what's a good blink though, eh? If you blink and you miss it, <laughs> you've done well. It's a, I think so. <laughs> you've timed it well, haven't you? There's only one good thing at Hokitika is the Hokitika Wildwood, the Wild Foods Festival. You've done that? No, I've never been there. Yeah, you, know, you can eat crocodile yeah. and all sorts. But anyway, go on. Sorry. But the, th- the thing, what I like, whenever I go back home to New Zealand, my family are in Hokitika, and I do a lot of deer stalking. So I really enjoy that, embracing that, getting up at half five in the morning, going for a walk on my own. It's great because. You know, New Zealand, the scenery is just fantastic, yeah. and I just, I just love going home and just relaxing there, just put a deer stalking and stuff like that. It is interesting because I, I think now I probably <laughs> would say UK over New Zealand as well, yeah. but it took yeah. quite a while to make that mm. shift to say that UK is home. But you know, you've got to give it to the UK people; they're very welcoming of us. Oh, they're nice, certainly. you know, highly educated. <laughs> Good-looking Kiwis. But I, I th- <laughs> speak for myself. Hello, humorous as well. Are you speaking for me? Or? <laughs> no, but the thing is, is the UK, they've got a similar sense of humor. Yes. And they're very welcoming like Kiwis yeah. are. Yeah. You know, which which draws people to this country. Yeah. I mean, like, again, you know, 87 I've been here, so I've been here a fair while. So, and obviously my children are born here as well. And obviously my wife's here from, from the UK as well, leads itself. So, UK, yeah. That's it, mate. Is yeah. that it? Thank it's, you. It's all good. So um, I just want to say, Gary, you've been a wonderful guest. You're Thank our you. first ever guest yeah, you are. on the Super Rugby podcast. Am I and f- maybe after this, the last. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very privileged. Thanks, gents, for having me. I really um, appreciate it. No, so, you know, if, if, if you've enjoyed the show today, yeah. then please go out there, write a quick review, subscribe, do all those things. Write an support, email. Let write us know. Email, let us know. But as always, until yeah. next time, it's been Catch a pleasure. Ya. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.